morning everybody and welcome to church this morning. It's good to see you all. Well, I can't see you all, but I know you can see me, but it's good to know you are all out there. Let's open our service in prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, as we gather together, we gather through separation, but we gather together through one in spirit. We come because we love you. We come because we know a little and we want to know more. So, Lord, we ask that you would bless this time, this time together. And we pray for the day when we can meet together again in this place. Bless everyone who uh, watches this morning and be with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to share with you today's reading, which comes from Matthew chapter 11, reading verses 16 to 20 and then 25 to 30. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children in the marketplace, sitting and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say he was a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things are being committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. I'd like to pass you over now to... Johnson McCotty, who will bring you the message today. Good morning, church. We just want to welcome you all for this morning service. Wherever you are, uh, we do welcome you to be part of this service. Uh, Let us pray. As Jesus praised his Father in heaven, so do we. We praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You have hidden these things from the wise and revealed them to us, your children, through Jesus, your most precious Son. We praise you, Lord. Amen. From the reading uh, which um, Russell has just read, We are going to move through the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 16 to 19, and verses 25 to 30. Uh, My theme today is how to handle criticism. How to handle criticism. Today, as our world continues to become ravaged by COVID-19, people are feeling anxious, impatient, frustrated, and critical. We are less busy with the things that normally hold our attention. We are bored with staying inside, refraining from seeing the people we love, and doing the activities that animate us. We are sick and tired of being sick and tired. The more pooped we feel, the angrier we get. And we often kind and calm demeanor is turning tester and more critical. As humans, When our surroundings and our world is robbed, when we feel we have lost control of our decision and our lives, we react in different ways. Some became depressed and feel helpless. Others became angry and critical. Into this kind of world, Jesus came in. In our scripture for today, the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus described a generation that is never satisfied. That is hypercritical that is aggressive, judgmental, that wants things to go the way they want and people to react the way they expect, according to their own personal preference and standards. 
When things don't go out the way they want, they become angry and spiteful, discontent and contrary, perverse, honoring, and impossible to please. It is impossible to go through life without being criticized. If you try to accomplish something, you'll be criticized. If you are satisfied to love, you'll be criticized for that. If you remain just sitting for the whole day, you'll be criticized. If you remain outside, walking around, you'll be criticized. So for anything that you do, you'll be criticized. I heard about a department store that made a big fuss over its million customer. The store president made a speech in her honor. She was given gifts. A picture was taken for the paper. After these ceremonies, the customer continued to her original destination, the complaint department. If anyone ever received lots of criticism, surely it was Jesus Christ. The religious establishment called him a blasphemer. He was accused of being a galatron, a drunkard, a Samaritan, a friend of sinners. The Bible refers to him as despised and rejected of men. His own family, though he was acting irresponsibly, in the 11th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, one can feel the pressure of Jesus' opposition building. John the Baptist has been arrested by King Herod. They want people around them to dance to their tune they play, to decide how others around them should behave and live. Or sometimes they have no rhyme or reason to their critique at all, except that they want to express their distaste and dissatisfaction at anything and everyone around them. So this kind of honoring behavior is not based on reason, but simply in the desire of disgrace or of disagree with anything or anyone other than themselves just because they feel a frustration inside they cannot appease. Jesus directs his critic to those gathered to hear him speak, both to strangers and disciples alike. His sermon that they were stricken with grief and mourning over the arrest of cousin John, called the Baptist. I imagine Jesus too felt fear at what was to come next for him in his own ministry. For he noticed already the public critics of John for his assertion were just as strong as his critic of his own men of ministry. His joy in eating, his joy in drinking, and celebrating with friends with whom they called sinners. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they came, they say, he is a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, he is a galloton and drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by yet he did. He could find no specific reason for their critique, except that they felt an internal unrest within them due to their circumstances and culture, causing them to lash out irrational at anyone around them, suggesting anything at all. The fact that is, Jesus is pointing out a very human reaction, one that is typical in times of stress, fear, loss of control, or a couch of unrest. It's no mistake that he addresses a generation and not a specific group of people. Jesus is describing a cultural milieu. He is identifying cultural symptoms of storm and stress. He knows that he will need to minister not to logical, rational, is people, but to dissatisfied, unhappy, frustrated people, angry people, honored people, depressed people. Especially during this COVID season, people are more in this scenario. In verses 16 and 17, Jesus says that people are like children. I invite them to play like we are having a wedding. In other words, to play a game, but they refuse. So I invite them to play a said game like we are having a funeral, but they don't want to do that either. People are just contrary, critical, hard to please. You can't understand them. Despite all that, Jesus did not despair or become bitter. His life was beautiful, resounding response to his critics. Today I invite us to imitate our Lord in how we deal with critics. How does he deal with critics? That's the point that I want you to take home. How do you deal with the critics? After all, Jesus came not only to save our eternal souls, but also to show us how to live effectively here on earth. Jesus is describing a conflicted and angry, passionate culture. One not all unlike our own. Did you ever get in a mood where you felt tired, bored, frustrated, angry, 
and because of circumstances out of your control, just felt ornery, as if nothing could please you. Some of you probably have kids who are feeling that way after being home from school at months. Maybe the conversation went something like this. Why are you looking gloomy? I don't know. I'm bored. What would you like to do? I don't know. Would you like to play a game? No. Would you like to help me make a lunch? No. Feeling more annoyed. Would you like to go outside? No. Feeling even more annoyed and slightly angry without knowing why. Would you like to clean your room? No. Leave me alone. Bubbling over and throwing a stuffed animal across the roof. Throwing a lot of things across the roof. Just throwing a lot of things because they don't know exactly how to handle issues. First, accept the fact that if you don't do anything significant, you'll be criticized. In other words, it goes with the territory. In fact, Jesus is saying that we should worry if no one is criticizing us. Why? Because nobody bothers to kick a dead dog or a dead lion. If someone is kicking you, you must have some life in you. As a novice pastor 29 years ago, it worried me terribly if anybody said anything negative about me or my church. I'd lose sleep over it while well, I have mellowed some with age. Now I know that as surely as boiling water produces steam, declaring and doing the gospel will produce critics. Secondly, don't let criticism immobilize you. I like the way Jesus reacted when word came to him that King Herod hated what he was doing so much that he was going to have him killed. Jesus said in, our, in my language, or our language, tell that old folks that I am too busy to worry about him. In Luke 13 verse 32, the pastor, John Maxwell, tells a story about a salesman who went to his barber for a haircut. He told the barber about his upcoming trip to Rome. The barber had only negative comments to make about the airline, the salesman he had chosen, the hotel where he was going to stay, and about Rome in general, and even about his hope of having an audience with the Pope. A month later, the salesman returned to the barber shop. He said, I have a wonderful trip, the flight was perfect, and the hotel service was excellent, and I got to meet the Pope. The barber asked, what did the Pope say to you? The salesman said, he placed his hand on my head and said, My son, where did you get such a loose haircut? May such an experience happen to every surplus and chronic critic. Let me suggest some ways to prevent criticism from immobilizing you. First, remember who you are. Whose you are. You and I are children of God in, who are made in his image. So precious we that God's Son, our Lord, died for us, that whoever is royal children of the King, we are children of the King. We are children of royalty. Therefore, though one may criticize what we say or do, no one can call into question who we are. Because God has already settled that and no amount of criticism should be able to make us doubt because I'm a child of God. That is the most important thing for you to know. Whenever people criticize you, you should remind them that you are a child of God, so you are not worried about what they say. Let me suggest another way to keep criticism from immobilizing you. Sift each criticism for precious grains of fame, truth. Even as a prospector sifts through creek and looking for gold, a caring, constructive critic can be your best friend. The late Norman Vincent Peale used to say, the trouble with most of us is that we would rather be ruined by praise than saved by criticism. For a long time, I mispronounced the last name of one of our church families. No member of that family ever said anything about it. But someone else came to me privately and said, Bill, you are pronouncing that name incorrectly. I did better for a while, but then lapsed back into the old way. My concerned critic did me the favor of coming to me a second time. Finally, I got it corrected for good. That critic did me a big favor because people don't like to hear their names mispronounced. Most criticism has at least a particular of truth in it. Look for that particular of truth and try to benefit from it. Perhaps the first time you hear a 
particular criticism, you may shake it off as invalid. Even if someone is rude, we should consider whether this is in any truth in their criticism. A wise man or a woman can accept the truth even when it is presented harshly. Proverbs 27 verse 5. But if you hear it a second time, especially from a second source, you better take it more seriously. The ancient Jewish rabbis had a saying that went like this. If one man calls thee a donkey, he did not. If two men call thee a donkey, get thee a saddle. And I'm not certain that they use the word donkey. You know what it means. A third way to keep criticism from immobilizing you is to let the untrue or unfair parts of the criticism roll off your life like water off a duck's back. There is no need to develop a matter's complex or feel sorry for yourself. To go around whining, poor me, has never helped anyone live more effectively. If an unfair criticism is made to you directly, just say thank you, brother or sister. I will consider it. Have a nice day. You may not need to consider it more than five seconds before dismissing it. Just say goodbye and you move on. You don't need to think about such things. In times of unrest, frustration and anger, this is hard to do. That's why we need Jesus more than ever. After Jesus' defense of John and his cultural insights that day about the people of his generation, he ended his speech with an invitation. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11 verse 28 to 30. Jesus is inviting those around him to rest from critic, to seek reprieve from conflict and complaint, but not just those who are the recipients of critic, no, especially those of his generation who are the aggressors of critic. For all of you know that honorary, contrary to feeling that turns out our pleasant personalities into perversities, and when we feel dissatisfied, bowed, frustrated, or shut in a symptom of an unrestful spirit inside, Jesus knows how to read people's mind. He knows how to read what is going through your mind, what is going through your heart. He knows how to understand our culture and the ways that people behave. And he knows that an unhappy spirit makes for judgmental and often unsuccessful, even harmful critic. But Jesus' answer is not just to give advice or abnormation or wag fingers in our direction. Instead, Jesus offers a yoke. He offers to take the lead and bear the brunt of everyone's frustration, anger, difficulty, and struggle. He offers a rest from our internal conflict and peace from our anger, a break from our never-ending frustration, a reprieve from our hopelessness. We are yoked with one who gives sufficient grace for every time of need to serve him as not bondage but perfect freedom. J.H. George says, the fatal mistake for the believer is to seek to bear life's load in a single collar. God never intended a man to carry his burden alone. Christ therefore deals only in yokes. A yoke is a neck harness of for two. And the Lord himself pleased to be one of the two. He wants to share the labor of any galling task. The secret of peace and victory in the Christian life is found in putting off the text and collar of self and accepting the masters and relaxing your so my friend sin is too heavy for you to carry you will really get a hernia if you try to carry your load of sin the only place in the world to put that burden is at the cross of jesus christ because he's the only one who can help you he bore it for you he invites you to come and bring your burden to of sin to him so that he can help you in your life jesus offers to fight the fight with us to give us back control of our lives by allowing us to glide in his powerful, safe, protective shelter. He is calling us to walk with him. It doesn't mean we give up in the fight, but Jesus asks us to trust him, to open up to him, to let him guide us in our efforts so that we too can learn the relation of art of critique. The kind of that leads change and healing and peace and humanity. Jesus came not just to tell what people to do, but how to live, 
How to feel peaceful in spirit and loving in love, in heart. For the artful heart is also peaceful and positive heart. A content and stable heart is what is needed. So the Christian art of critic, not something we can learn to do by following another rule or inhaling more wisdom, but by following Jesus Christ, is simply allowing Jesus to take the reins and steer our lives to come to into our hearts and turn our stormy and conflicted disposition into a pool of two waters. That is what Jesus is calling us to do. So when we are willing to seek rest for our souls in the welcoming yoke of Jesus, we will then be ready to enter into a world of unrest and be the peace within it, us. To give the world not mere criticism, but artful critic. Not simple reprimand, but creative recourse. Think before you critique anyone. Think what is going to happen. You have to think the way how to help the person. Be the person you should be. You need to praise someone and not to critic them. The Bible says that if the Spirit of Christ lives in you, you will produce the following fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, fidelity, gentleness, and self-control. That is in Galatians 5, verse 22. Are you seeing this, those fruits in your life? If you are fruit-producing tree, don't worry about undoubted criticism. Don't worry about those criticisms that are happening. When you really think about it, we Christians ought to be better equipped to deal with criticism than any other person on earth. Why? If God created us in his own image and loved us enough to die for us, then no criticism should ever be able to threaten our basic self-worth. Because you are a child of God. Remember that. In fact, we ought to be able to harness criticism and make it serve a godly purpose. God knows how much you are worthy. Don't ever let anybody's criticism make you forget it. Don't may let anybody's criticism make you feel unworthy. Have you recently been criticized by anyone else? I encourage you to apply these principles above. Because the Bible in James 1 verse 22 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only receiving yourself. You need to be doers. So after listening to this sermon, you need now to apply it to your own life. So that you are not afraid of people who criticize you. You are able to go beyond their critic. Because you are a child of God. God loves you. May the good Lord bless you. From now and evermore. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for the love you have for us. We thank you for everything that you have given us. We thank you that you are able to help us even when we face criticism and challenge from our friends. We are able to move forward. We are able to go on. Even when Jesus was being criticized, he never stopped. He continues to move on. So when we face criticism in this world where we are, we should move on and continue to save you, Lord Jesus Christ, because you are the focus of our attention. Thank you, Father, for allowing us and help us to understand that when we are being criticized, it has nothing to do with us, it's to do with you as well. Father, help us as we go through these difficult moments when people criticize us from all corners, from all sides, but we remain faithful to you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, I'll ask uh, Russell to come and lead in uh, Holy Communion. Thank you, Russell. Come. As we gather together for communion and to share in the bread and the wine, I'd like to share with you a familiar passage, one that we read quite often. And it's from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, reading verse 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Very familiar verses, but let's go over them fairly slowly. The Lord Jesus. We remember that this is the Lord's table. On the night he was betrayed, there were some who followed Jesus, but there will always be others who wish to avoid Jesus or to betray him. And they were represented on the night. But he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, the Lord Jesus gave thanks in the circumstances he was to face. And he calls us in all circumstances, no matter what they're like, to give thanks. He broke it. We used to live near a baker and some nights you would drive past and you would smell the bread and so we would buy a fresh piece of bread and take it home, fresh loaf. And when we broke the bread, the aroma was overpowering and we just loved putting butter onto that bread and eating it. When Jesus' life was broken, for us, it was a sweet aroma. So he broke the bread and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we remember today what Christ has done for us. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it. The blood poured out, the body broken. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we, we, we celebrate, we are told to proclaim that Christ is risen and to proclaim his death and resurrection right up until he comes again. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Loving God, as we share in this feast, we come with hearts of thanksgiving. We come acknowledging what you have done for us. We come being reminded that we have salvation through your death and through your resurrection. So we need not fear death. We need not fear separation because we know that the act has been done and we shout hallelujah and as we gather too we come and we we ask that you would forgive us for anything that we may have done and bring us to this table with clean hearts hearts that are forgiven for any way in which we may have offended you so lord as we gather we gather as a family we gather as more than just individuals we gather as a body of Christ, working together, living together, and proclaiming together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on that night, he was betrayed, took the bread and broke it. He broke the bread, which is his gift of brokenness for our wholeness. The cup we take and we celebrate that his life was poured out so that ours might be fulfilled. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And I invite you to share in the blood or the blood and the bread, body of Christ, as represented in these elements, the bread and the wine. Please take a moment to share among yourselves. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, as we have taken these elements, we take them as a body of Christ. Use us, each of us with our giftings, that we might be a body in this town, in this community, and a body beyond, that the message of your salvation, of your death, your resurrection, your inspiring, can bring wholeness to individuals that make up this community. Use us as your body and your blood that we might bring 
salvation to others through your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we bring our offering uh, for the use and the work of Christ, let's pray over the offering. Loving God, you call us to be generous in many aspects of our life. That generosity comes from the love you have instilled in us and called, asked us to work your love through us that others may benefit. And as we bring our gifts, we bring not just monetary gifts, but our love for you and for others. We pray that you would use us so that our lives may be a sweet offering for others who hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Russell, for the service of Holy Communion. And uh, we are now about to close our service today. Uh, and I wish everyone a wonderful week ahead of us. Let us pray. We pray for all in authority that they will be respectful, conscious of the weight on their shoulders, and that they will act responsible for the people they save. We pray for them in their personal lives with the worries and cares that they only see. We pray for our friends, family, colleagues. We pray that as we walk alongside them, you will use us, bring them closer and closer to you, and they will learn of your love. Thank you. We pray that when we receive criticism, we should go on and move on. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.